What is up guys, Jason here bringing you our first Duel Masters Top 10 video. Yes, uh, it's something that every content creator seems to do and I think a lot of people like watching Top 10 videos, I certainly do. So I thought, hey, why don't we get in on the action as well? So we are coming at you with the Light Civilization. First, we're going to be doing these videos in the order that they are printed in the English sets. So we go with light and then we finish with nature. Andrew and I are gonna take turns presenting. It just so happens that I'm first. Uh, and yeah, so now a couple of other things that we should probably let you know. The way we went about doing these lists is Andrew and I would each come up with our own top 10 lists and we would compare them against one another. It was actually really interesting to look at each other's thought processes and light was actually really hard to do um, because there's just so many cards and it's a very i never really realized how diverse and how multi-dimensional the lights of was until we did this list anyway uh we had to set some parameter to kind of have some sort of basis to making this list so we tried to balance the answers to the following three questions one how likely am i to play this card when running the sieve uh, basically how much of a staple is it Two, how much does this card make me want to include the sieve in my deck? And three, the simplest one, how good is this card? So we just take a look at the stats, what it does, and we kind of look at it in the context of other cards that are also playable. And then we kind of just balance the answers to those three to um, try to place a card on the list. Uh, understandably, these are going to be our opinions. Uh, inevitably, I'm going to leave somebody's favorite card off the list, or you guys are going to think, hey... Oh, this card is supposed to be on the list. You guys are idiots. Jason, you are the worst. And yeah, I guess that is true. But um, you watch my video, so thank you for that. And, you know, why don't you guys just share your um, top 10 like cards down in the comments as well. Um, it should be an interesting read to go through. So before we start things off, I thought we would get into the honorable mentions first. So starting off, we have Logic Cube, uh, a card I think has some very neat uses and a lot of potential. But oftentimes I feel like it is quite lacking. A lot of our lists forego its inclusion, and while I am working on an engine around it, it doesn't quite make the cut just yet. Spoiler, some similar cards appear on the list, so all is not lost for spell search. Another honorable mention we can take a look at is Larb Gear the Immaculate. Super neat card with a good race, great stats, and an excellent effect. It's great for closing out games, and it really helps rush decks a lot, which is... Well, that's obviously a good thing if you can have more viable decks, right? Now, in terms of versatility, we think it is a little lacking since the card, you know, it kind of just fits into one or two archetypes, kind of like that rush or aggro style. And in comparison to the other cards that made the list, it just didn't seem as versatile. So sadly, we had to leave it off. Another honorable mention, Rapid Reincarnation. It's a card that I actually haven't seen too much of, but I think it's super cool. Uh, this is one of the Soul Swap style effect cards, which gives you the opportunity to trade a weak creature for a much stronger one without directly paying for its mana cost. It's more limited than Soul Swap, since you also need to be holding that creature, the creature you're swapping into in your hand, on top of the meeting the mana requirements and holding Rapid Reincarnation. But it could be a very creative card and also could be very game-swinging nonetheless. Also keep in mind that it can be used on both you and your opponent and on either player's turn, so that's also very neat. Unfortunately, it's not an exact shoe in for any of the three categories that I mentioned, which is why we ultimately had to leave it off. Another honorable mention we have is Petrova, Channeler of Suns, big fan favorite, at least I think. Uh, Petrova is very unique in terms of what she brings to the table. The power boosting effect complements a variety of strategies such as defensive builds when paired with Palo Elises, or in more aggressive builds such as bolstering the power of your beast folk or guardian rush deck or something to that effect. Alternatively, you may be able to use her as the main attacker as well. I can imagine her working in a deck that plays a lot of spot removal and kind of just tries to bombard your opponent with Petrova and plus one creatures. Ultimately, though, I feel like her power level at 3500 is a tiny bit lacking, and she feels a lot like a jack of all trades but master of none. You know, if you think about it, like, you don't. When somebody says a Petrova deck, aside from maybe the Pala Petrova combo, nothing really springs to mind. So, you know, I guess a couple of the things that I mentioned combined with her lack of splash ability is ultimately why we had to leave her off. 
Last honorable mention, we have Palo Lisa's Morning Guardian. Similar to Petrova, I think Palo Lisa's can really benefit uh, certain kinds of builds. And more so than that, I feel like it helps a lot of, you know, air quotes, rogue concepts, if, you know, if that term even applies. But I feel like to get the most out of Palo Lisa's, you really have to, to pair it with the right cards, or you have to be in a certain situation for it to be truly devastating. Uh, in our experience anyway, so we felt like it came out stronger on paper than in practice, which is why it ultimately misses out on the list, even though I personally think it's a super fantastic card. Starting off the list in the number 10 spot, we have Miss Rhea's Sonic Guardian. At first glance, this card seems absolutely broken because of how many cards you can draw if he's left unchecked. However, we find him better on paper than in practice. As it turns out, we opt not to play him in many of our decks because of how much he costs and how easy it is to get rid of him. The thing with Duel Masters, and I guess card games in general, is that it's generally favorable to play a card you get immediate value out of rather than those you don't, i.e. passive cards. This is the reason why Silent Skill isn't considered to be a very good mechanic. We can't put Misrius any higher because of how killable he is, and while I have no doubt we can debate this till the cows come home, the fact of the matter is I wouldn't want the creature that makes my deck run to be removed before we can even you know, get our deck to do what it's supposed to do. So he's able to crack the list, but he doesn't move any higher than that. Coming in at the number 9 spot, we have Sarius Vizier of Suppression. What an awful inclusion to the list, you must be thinking. In fact, as, I, as did I at first. But Sarius is a card that actually meets the criteria fairly well. We are very likely to play him in most decks with light, and it's a solid card overall. We all know about his anti-rush capabilities, but his race of Initiate gives him the edge over blockers with comparable stats and functions. You know, Initiate has great evolution in the form of uh, Gleis Magicula, Craze Valkyrie, even Kizar Bicycle is pretty decent. So yeah, that's I, I think that goes a long way. Now sure, he falls flat in terms of how much does this card make me want to play light, but in terms of reliability and playability, Solid Sari scrapes the number 9 spot. For the number 8 spot, we've chosen Reign of Arrows. Now, as you guys know, this is a card that we talk about a lot in our other videos, but it's just a really solid card in terms of cost to value. At worst, you see what your opponent's hand is, but at best you make them discard a few cards. It can sometimes feel like you're missing out by not playing Darkness, because Darkness is the only sieve that gets unconditional discard, but Reign of Arrows at least helps to sort of alleviate that. One of our favorite plays is actually playing Reign of Arrows on turn 6 to prevent a Lost Soul. As you know, Lost Soul is very scary. It's a great tech card that I feel most light decks would want to run, but naturally you aren't forced to run the Light Sieve because of it, since as far as this card goes, Darkness just brings more to the table. Reign of Arrows discarding ability you could look at as a consolation prize, but it's a very, very good consolation prize, and you know because of all of the factors that I've mentioned, we've got Reign of Arrows in the top 10. Number 7 is an interesting choice, and one I deliberated on for quite a while. I consider it interesting because when Andrew and I reviewed each other's top 10s, this is one of the mere 3 mutual cards we had. Foul was an overlooked card in my own personal history with the game, but it has a great effect that is difficult to substitute, with some respectable stats to boot. I'm willing to admit Farzi the Oracle makes a great case, and you could very well replace Foul with him, and I wouldn't bat an eyelid, but Foul's the choice we're going with. We're all about that instant gratification. I found Foul quite similar to our next choice, but the fact you sort of need to build a deck around him is why we bumped him down in the end. Overall, a very formidable choice and an endearing card. Given the description from the previous entry, it should come as no surprise that the number 6 spot is going to Foremost Sanctum Guardian Q. Yes, he's a survivor, but we don't really care about that. Like Fal, he has some great stats, uh, he's a mini-boss in his own right, and I think the power of mini-bosses is something that tends to get understated some of the time. I think it's really useful to have one around just so you can maintain board control and just have the flexibility to keep swinging at your opponent should, uh, should you not be able to find your boss monster, right? Now, the reason we prefer him to foul is because we find spell search to be just as useful but more versatile than spell retrieval, and as a result, he can find his way into more decks. Apart from the clutch draw and destruction spells you can pull off with Fal, 
that you can also pull off with four bows. You can also consistently curve into powerhouse spells like Lost Soul, Apocalypse, Vice, and Miraculous Plague, and I just think that's super neat. So at the end of the day, four bows is quite comparable to Fel, but we give him the slight edge. All right, so now we are taking a look at a card that I originally thought very little of, but cannot find it any longer, Colon the Oracle. Now I'll admit, I didn't really want him on the list when I was first making it, but considering pretty much all of our decks of the light run him, there's really no way I could have excluded him. Almost always an immediate inclusion in a deck with light, despite not commanding the inclusion of the sieve, and being a tad lackluster when compared to other shield trigger creatures like Surfer and Loco, Colon has a very impressive track record when it comes to saving as well as closing out games, and this, combined with his general usefulness, is what earns him the first spot on our top 5. Right, so you guys are probably bored, you're probably waiting for something interesting to happen. Uh, whoa, Jason, when are you gonna put on an interesting card? I'm tired of hearing about all of these staples. Alright, so here we go. Number 4, your prayers have been answered. Warlord Elzonius. In terms of how he affects the board, I feel like Warlord Elzonius is what Alcadius should have been. This guy is the quintessential example of how to make a formidable evolution card. His race is actually pretty good, as the base forms are fairly low maintenance, that is, cheap and have decent utility. If you think about it, you have those two, three mana blockers, and you have Bingle, who summons himself when he's discarded. So that's pretty decent. He has great stats and an extremely powerful effect. Similar to other great boss cards like Bloom, Cryptic, Bormedius, he has the ability to dodge shield triggers, which is amazing, and he's arguably stronger than them through his hexproofing, so he's protected even when he isn't breaking shields. Once he hits the field, he becomes very hard to get rid of, and had the Duel Masters TCG carried on, I think we would have seen a lot more of Warlord Elzonius. The number 3 spot is going to a personal favorite of mine, Kraze Valkyrie the Drastic. Kraze is the probably the best example of a utility boss card since you can use his effect in a couple of different ways. For instance, you can use it to gain board control by tapping creatures to kill, or you can use it to close out games by tapping your opponent's blockers. Then there's the general pressure of being a speed attacker double breaker, and having power 7500, can I get a hashtag light privilege, he's also able to run over some key threats in the form of Walmedius and Twin Cannon, while also stopping their protection as he taps two creatures. Because of how good some of the base initiates are, it makes so much sense to just throw Kraze in light decks, so while Kraze may not necessarily force us to include light in our decks, he still makes a solid case, and more so than that, in our opinion, his combination of speed, power, and splash ability make him one of the best bosses and light cards around. These last two entries really shouldn't come across as a surprise to anyone. Andrew and I even had the exact same picks. So at number two, we have Magris, Vizier of Magnetism. One of the mainstays of the light Civ. you'd be hard pressed to find a light deck without him. Magris is a nice plus one, he has good stats, and tops it all off with an amazing race. It really shouldn't come as a surprise to have him at the number two slot, and he can of course only be topped by one thing. Number one, Holio. I'm sure you all saw this coming. Holia is, in our opinion, and no doubt many other people's opinions, the best card in the Light Civ, and one of the best cards of the game in general. It's a surefire inclusion for any deck running Light, fine, almost any deck, and we often find ourselves wanting to play Light just so we can include Holia in it. The effect is great as you can use it offensively to break your opponent's board, or defensively to stop an attack and end your opponent's turn. It takes all the boxes, so there's no card more fitting for the number one spot than Holio. So that's our list. There's no doubt that certain omissions are going to offend some people, but we did the best we could, and man, was that a tough list to make. As I've mentioned, Light is in a way the most versatile sieve, because lineups for the Light section will vary greatly across decks. This is in comparison to other sieves, which tend to use more or less the same cards, I feel. In any case, I hope you enjoyed this video. For the next top 10, we are moving on to a probably less divisive list in water. See you guys next time.